right page. Hello, and welcome to our first live taping of KHN's What the Health. I'm your host, Julie Rovner, Chief Washington Correspondent at Kaiser Health News. I'm joined by some of the best and smartest health reporters in Washington. You will meet them all shortly. We are here to bring you the latest in news about health policy from the White House, Capitol Hill, federal agencies, and the states. For those of you not in our live audience, we're taping on Thursday, January 18th at 1 p.m. As with all news in Washington, say it with me, people, things can change fast, and things might have changed by the time you hear this. So this week, we're going to do things a little differently. I'm going to introduce our first panel. We're going to talk about the news of the week, since there is a lot. Then we'll do a switch and bring up the rest of our podcasters, along with our special guest, former Medicare and Medicaid chief and all-around smart health policy guy, Tom Scully. Our second panel will talk about what 2018 might bring health policy-wise. And after we chat, rather than our usual extra credits, we will take some live audience questions. So be thinking, those of you here in the room. So let's get to it. Here for panel one, we have to my left, Sarah Cliff, Vox.com, Paige Winfield Cunningham of the Washington Post, and Alice Alstein, Talking Points Memo. So ladies, the news never stops. It is not Groundhog Day for another couple of weeks, but here we are again looking at another possible shutdown of the government. Lots of health policy issues on the line, including still the Children's Health Insurance Program. Where are we as of 1 o'clock? <laughs> We are um, on the 110th day of CHIP not having funding, I believe is our count. And we seem pretty stuck. I mean, I'm curious what you guys think, but it seems like we're in a situation where Republicans have proposed a six-year six funding bill. Um, we got the news last week that I think was in time for the podcast that it actually saves money now to extend the CHIP program for the next decade. But um, you have Democrats pushing for 10 years, not accepting any sort of budget bill that also doesn't deal with DACA. And CHIP is once again, I, well, I guess, still in limbo. It's not really clear what's going going to happen with it at this point. And I think this is, when well, you say things might have changed, when people listen to this, maybe that's been resolved. But um, it's it kind doesn't of, really look like it. <laughs> it's a surprising moment for CHIP, which has long been a very bipartisan program, is very different from the Affordable Care Act in that way, to end up in this kind of stalemate and seems to be becoming very much a bargaining chip for Republicans who want to entice Democrats into supporting a budget deal and bring them on board. But I don't think it's going to be enough without something on DACA. Well, it's sort of it's sort of unfortunate that Chip is now caught up in in this whole spending negotiation because, really, the political barriers to passing it are gone now. As we learned from the CBO last week, that now if they do the six year reauthorization, it's budget neutral, and if they do longer, it actually saves money. And when I heard that last week, I was like, oh well they're gonna pass it tomorrow. I mean, tomorrow, like this is what they've been fighting about is the, the pay force for the last few months. But now the problem is that because it got pushed and it's caught up in this in the spending thing, and as Sarah said, the Republicans see as the as this leverage to try to get Dems on board, that now that might not, not necessarily happen. And we have this whole other political obstacle to getting it passed. Alice, you've been up on the hill. <laughs> yes, and we had some fun drama just this morning. Uh, so Republicans had, sort of coalesced around a strategy to use CHIP to pressure Democrats to vote for the spending bill. It didn't have, they didn't have to pair CHIP with the spending bill. As you said, they could have passed it on its own once they found out it was revenue neutral or before. Um, but they chose to attach it to the short-term continuing resolution in order to pressure Democrats to vote for it and hit them rhetorically if they don't. But well, originally, the thought was that was the only way they could get it passed is they right. had to pay for it. And so you had to roll it into this larger bill. Exactly. But and now they want, to, they, want to get, they want to use CHIP as a bargaining chip because they want to do the short-term spending bill without the immigration, the, the fix for the, the dreamers that the Democrats right. have said they won't vote for another well, short-term spending bill Depends if your without. they includes our president, too. <laughs> well, that's, that was the drama this going. morning. And so that strategy was rolling along. There was a press conference last night where Republicans got up and said, Democrats, how dare you? Uh, vote to throw little kids off their health care, you know. And then this morning, the president tweeted a sort of cryptic tweet, um, which to many people made it sound like he opposed attaching chip to the spending bill at all. But then the sort of Republican leadership cleanup crew came in and said, oh no, what he really meant was uh, that he supports the six year reauthorization of chip. Uh, and what he doesn't want is a short-term reauthorization of CHIP. There was a lot of sort of reading the tea leaves there, but privately Republicans said they're completely confused about what the president wants. This scrambles their efforts uh, and just makes 
this chaos on the hill even worse this week? I've seen a lot of finger pointing in my day. I don't think I've ever seen the kind of finger pointing that's gone on in the last 24 hours about, you know, no, it's your fault that CHIP isn't getting renewed. No, it's your fault that CHIP isn't getting renewed. But I think what, I mean, I'm curious for your perspective, Julie, since you've been on the Hill longer than I have. Um, you know, it seems like House Republicans are a little more ambivalent about CHIP than the House Republicans who served a decade ago or five years ago. I think if you know, there really was this, you know, real commitment to the program, the idea that it's important, that this would have been resolved. And I think part of it is about leverage, but part of it seems to be like, uh, like an okayness with if this lapses for a little while that I don't know if we saw from the last generation of Republican legislators. Well, some, <clears throat> some lobbyists have expressed to me concerns that if if this situation goes on longer and the, the funding really is allowed to lapse, Republicans are gonna look at how states are responding and, and maybe some states are gonna be able to pump in some of their own funds or you know other states certainly are gonna have to kick a lot of people off of the rolls, but from the perspective of some of the Tea Party Republicans, they might not necessarily see that as a bad thing. Overall, they see it as a good thing when Medicaid enrollment shrinks. Well, and they so, also see it as a fine thing if the government shuts down. I mean, that's yeah. that's the problem here, is that the very conservative Republicans won't vote for the spending bill, so they need to get Democrats to keep the government open. Right, and the concern is, so if you see these, the, 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 if they start seeing the effects out in the states of, of CHIP, uh, you know, states losing this funding, and they think, well, mate, it's not that bad, it's fine, you know, that that might, you know, keep kind of fueling this, this standstill we see. So the other big bipartisan uh, program that's hanging in the balance is community health centers. And they've been sort of attached to CHIP for the last couple of reauthorization cycles. And somehow they seem to have fallen off the radar in this one. They have fallen off the radar. And I, I will also note that um, the CHIP reauthorization that they're putting forward right now is revenue neutral, but they are pairing it with delays of several of Obamacare's major taxes, which is not revenue neutral. But it's also kind of bipartisan. <laughs> yes, it is kind of bipartisan. Um, and the idea with that is to entice the more conservative Republicans to go along with this. But talking to the head of the Freedom Caucus this week, he told me they do not see that as much of an enticement at all. It's not a good sweetener for them. They see it as sort of crumbs of Obamacare repeal when they want the whole cake, et cetera, et cetera. So really, they're losing Dems. They're losing Republicans. It's not looking good on either side. It's also interesting to me that Republicans aren't really cheerleading the community health centers right now, because I think I recall uh, in the whole push to defund Planned Parenthood that they were going to try to redirect those funds to community health centers. And at that point, I remember Republicans really talking a lot about the importance of these centers and how they serve the low income. So that's sort of a weird irony to me. Well, yeah, I mean, Republicans have been, you know, very much, they, they were um, behind the original doubling of funding for community health centers in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s. That was one of their big, you know, they wanted to double NIH and double funding for community health centers, which they did. So it's, it's just sort of strange that that everything is sort of up in the air right now but that seems an odd thing to have kind of fallen off in in these in what's at least an attempt to become bipartisan and keeping the government open um, I want to move on for a minute last week we spent some time talking about the decision by the Trump administration to allow states to impose work requirements for some of their Medicaid populations sure enough we got the news the official news about Kentucky just after we finished taping but today I want to talk about some of the other Medicaid changes in the Kentucky waiver changes that other states are likely to ask for and maybe get to that aren't work requirements we talked about work requirements a lot last week Sarah you've written about this what else is Kentucky doing to its Medicaid program Yes, I think the work requirement has certainly gotten the most attention, but we're talking about something much bigger, something that's really going to overhaul Medicaid. Um, so a few of things that are going on both in Kentucky, and we see these across this suite of um, nine other waivers that states have submitted, is longer is a possibility of a lockout period. If people are not going to pay these small premiums that are required by the state, they could lose their Medicaid coverage for a period of time. That is something states have requested for a little while now, but the Obama administration has been pretty firm on not allowing states, saying this goes against the um, purpose of Medicaid. And those premiums in general are another thing. We've seen a little bit of that in Indiana, which has been pioneering some of this work, kind of went as far as you could go under the Obama administration. Um, but that's a really big change. Another one that I think is pretty wonky but can matter is retroactive eligibility. So this idea that if you go to 
the hospital, you have some terrible emergency, like let's say you have a heart attack, um, and it turns out you were eligible for Medicaid when that happened, that the state is going to kick in for those bills. Um, that is also something that would disappear under the Kentucky waiver, and that'd be a big deal, you know, for that person who has the heart attack. That's, you know, hundreds or tens, at least tens of thousands of dollars of Medicaid debt. So we're really talking about some big changes to the program. You know, those are the two that come to mind for me as some of the major ones. I don't know if there's other ones we want to get to as well, but those those really reshape the program. And I think, um, you know, one of our next part panelists, Margo Singer Katz, had a great piece today in the New York Times about just the paperwork, you know, of having to show that you're there, having to show that you're doing the work requirement. Um, a lot of that can have the effect of reducing enrollment. Um, so I think the expectation is those sorts of things, coupled with the work requirement, they're going to mean that less people in Kentucky have Medicaid a few years from now um, than currently do. Alice, you wanted to add something. Sure. Um, what also jumped out to me in the Kentucky waiver is um, limits on actual care that, that people can receive. There were um, new limits on non-emergency transportation and some dental and vision benefits. And so I think it's important to see this as not only um, reducing the number of people covered and making it more difficult to be eligible, but also reducing uh, the kind of care people can receive if they are indeed eligible. I would, I would note, though, I mean, like, <clears throat> you know, a lot of states are, are facing real challenges and paying for their for their Medicaid programs. And then also, if you look at pulling on the work requirements, it's actually one of the more like or, or the, the less unpopular things that Trump has proposed. Actually, there's been pretty strong public support behind this type of thing, not just for Medicaid, but for welfare programs um, for quite some time. I haven't seen polling on those other things Sarah mentioned, but, um, you know, so I think like that, you know, in, in the whole spectrum of the changes that the Trump administration could make to the healthcare system, this is um, probably the most realistic. But I have been a little bit surprised at how slow it has seemed that for the administration to respond to these waiver requests. And of course, there was that whole issue, I think, last fall where Oklahoma and I think Iowa were trying to get waiver approvals for reinsurance programs. And, and that kind of introduced this whole question of was the Trump administration willing to help states improve their marketplaces? Minnesota, too. And Right. At a, at a time when, you know, Republicans were still trying to do repeal, replace. And yet there were all of these states that were really deeply concerned about these mid income folks who were finding premiums really unaffordable. And so there was that whole episode, I think, where the administration ind indicated they were going to approve Oklahoma's waiver and then last minute didn't. And then Oklahoma withdrew its request. So I'm just kind of curious to see this year, you know, what how quickly they they move move ahead, and uh, particularly on those waivers for the marketplaces. Now that repeal replaces dead, and this really is kind of the only venue for them to try to make changes to the ACA. More clearly, more changes to come. Um, while we're talking about the states, it looks like some blue states might try to replace the repealed federal insurance mandate with their own state level requirements. Um, Sarah, again, you wrote about this about Maryland's proposal last week. How would it work? Yeah, so I fell down a bit of a rabbit hole with Maryland's proposal, um, which I found really interesting. And I think they're kind of first out of the gate who introducing this policy to replace the individual mandate and not just replace it, but really do their own kind of thing. And I think they, the thing I've seen a lot in health policy is one state tries out something and then it bounces from state to state and others implement it. And I think the Maryland one might be the kind of ball that bounces across the country. Their proposal, they call it um, uh, health insurance down payment. I call it more individual mandate plus. I think they're just different framings on it. So they still want to require people to have health insurance. The people I've talked to who are working on it say the fee would be roughly similar to the fees that the federal government charges right now. But what they would do if someone is assessed to have to pay a fee because in the previous year they didn't have health insurance, they would ask, are you still without health insurance? And if that person said yes on a tax filing, they would say, okay, we will take this money at the state and um, it could go to nothing, or what we want to default you in, it's to a health insurance plan, and we are going to use this money to pay your monthly premium. Um, the idea is to make that the default option, that they are defaulted in a, probably a bronze level, kind of skimpier plan that could be covered by their payment. And then if they you know, want to check a box and opt out of it, then their fee will go to the government. So it's kind of, it's an interesting idea when I've talked to some of the state senators and also um, Stan Dorn at, at um, who's now Families USA, who's kind of working with them on it. 
he says the idea is not to collect money. It would be great if Maryland didn't collect any penalties and if people just decided, hey, you know, I want to use this money to purchase a health insurance plan. Um, there certainly are some hurdles with it. Um, it, it. There's a lot of churn in the in, in the individual market. So there's a question of, you know, if someone didn't have insurance last year, are they still not going to have insurance? Will they be able to use that money as a down payment or will they already be in a plan? Um, and how many people will have access to those zero dollar plans? Um, I think because, strangely, because of the Trump administration's decision not to finance the cost sharing reduction subsidies, a lot of people are getting more generous subsidies. So they think there's a decent number of Marylanders who could use their penalty to buy a bronze level plan. But there still are some kinks. We don't really know how it would work till we'd see it in real life. But it's it's an interesting proposal, and it's one that um, it seems like Maryland's pretty enthusiastic about. Beyond California, is anybody else talking about doing their own? Man, any other any yeah. other states that we've seen so far? I mean, one would assume that these would be blue states that would do this. I know D.C. Well, we're not a state, but the District of Columbia is um, considering that. I think those are the three I've heard about. Oh, I know Washington State is interested in, but they're in a bit of a bind because Washington State does not have an income tax. So they would like to entice people to buy health insurance, but aren't quite sure they have the right mechanisms to do it. Um, Stan Dorn at Families, he said he thinks there's 10 states that run their own marketplaces and have a state level income tax that they could use to do the Maryland approach if they wanted to. So, so and of course, we have to see whether Maryland actually does yes. it. It's only just been proposed. Yes, it doesn't even exist in legislative language yet, so we're early. I, I was just going to add that I think it, I would be kind of surprised, honestly, if a lot of states went this route. Like, for one thing, as Sarah mentioned, I think there's like seven states in total that don't have income tax, so they have really a tricky question about how you would actually do the penalty. And then, I mean, the advantage of the federal mandate was that it was all standardized, but if you have like different state mandates, then you have insurers that are selling in multiple states that have different requirements and then employers that are operating in multiple states so I could see like a lot of um, kind of logistical problems with it potentially and then politically it can be a little bit hard to mandate people to do to do anything I mean maybe it would fly in some of these states but it, it I was would be the most unpopular piece of the affordable it was era. right yeah so. and I think that's why it's being described as a health insurance down payment instead of an individual yeah, mandate I will say the people who would likely like this is the insurance industry so the idea is is you know the people who are out of the market would likely be the people insurance insurers want into the market so they would likely be a lobby in favor of this but then again like the idea of requiring people to have health insurance is never proven popular i will say the one other state is massachusetts obviously well, they, they have already one. have one yeah. mandate so they are in better shape Thank than the rest of Romney. them yes um, all right, last question for this panel. Um, we got some new uninsured numbers from Gallup this week, and while the nerd in me cautions that these are generally not the government numbers that we all rely on, they do seem to show a pretty steep decline in 2017 uh, in the number of people with health insurance compared to the year before. What do we know about what might have caused this? Paige. You know, this is like real, a, a little bit surprising to me when I looked at the numbers because um, if I was just going to think about like the marketplaces and the people that are struggling to afford, co afford coverage, I would think that it was more of that like mid level, mid income person. But actually, um, you see the, the the biggest increase in the, in the uninsured rate was among people earning less than thirty seven thousand a year, and then also the biggest increases were among non whites, so blacks and Hispanics, and it's. I mean, it's 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 unfortunate from a you know health policy advocate perspective because we're sort of moving back a little bit to where we were in in 2013, particularly in you know in those disparities among the poor and minorities. And the that disparity is also bodes ill for the insurance pool itself and uh, premium costs going forward because when you don't have younger people and that was the also the biggest decline yeah, those, the, those under 25 you're right were, had declined were the sharpest lot. decline um two percent i think um down in 2017 and they're the ones that help balance out the risk pool and make premiums affordable for everyone and it also bodes ill for the future because uh, people of color and young people are also the groups that uh, need to be reached out to the most and encouraged to sign up for health insurance um, and the Trump administration cut outreach uh, by 90%. And even though we saw some pretty good enrollment, it those groups in particular could see sharper declines in the coming year. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I spent some time on the phone yesterday talking to people about this, and I had the same reaction as Paige. It would have been really easy to tell a story about rising premiums and unaffordability, but the population that's losing coverage is actually very heavily subsidized or have access to the Medicaid program. And the thing that came up the most in my conversations was whether this uncertainty about the individual mandate was what really had the effect here. That people kind of got a nudge, like maybe you don't have to sign up for health insurance. Maybe the government doesn't think that's important anymore. Even though individual mandate repeal didn't happen until the very end of December, it, it might have been that message out there that you know actually we don't really care if you sign up for health insurance. That for those edge cases, for someone who you know is 25 and kind of like debating, do I really want to spend? you know, even like $30, $50 a month on this, that might have been enough to nudge them in the direction of not having health insurance. But I think, as you were saying, Julie, we'll kind of wait for the federal numbers, see if they confirm this. But it, it surprised me, but I think the trend will probably continue into this coming year. You know, last year, the thing that was, we didn't really have a lot of policy change, even though there was a lot of policy uncertainty. This year with the association health plans, with individual mandate repeal, we do have a lot of policy change that suggests this trend will continue into 2018. And you know, plus we constantly see in polls that people think with all the discussion about repealing that, that mm -hmm. the affordable yes. care act is, there's, there's a s and not insignificant percentage of the population that thinks the health law has been repealed. Well, and just to go back to our original topic, CHIP, that's one thing states are really, really worried about is they're having to, to think about, well, at what point do we start sending out notices to people? That practical question, because if we send out a notice that their coverage is going to end and then Congress does something last minute, now they've caught cast all these people into uncertainty at the same time they want to make sure that people are informed about what's happening so Alice, last word oh yes and Gallup Gallup um, when they put out the data noted that the uncertainty was a major factor uh, not just around the individual mandate but the status of the entire Affordable Care Act was very much in flux this year thanks you know with multiple repeal attempts in Congress and the president continually publicly declaring the law dead um, that obviously caused widespread confusion and if if you're just a regular working person and you're not following the news minute by minute that you could come away with a lot of misconceptions about what kind of law we have in place today no more of a role for us um, <laughs> thank you panel one please thank this fine panel um, and they're gonna swap out with the equally august panel two And Tom, you're going to have to turn on your microphone. Got it? <laughs> OK. Welcome to the rest of our podcast gals, as Joanne likes to call them, uh, here to prognosticate. Uh-uh, let me finish. We have, starting next to me, Margot Sanger Katz of the New York Times, Joanne Kennan of Politico, Stephanie Armour of the Wall Street Journal, and the one of those who doesn't look like the others at the end is Tom Scully. As I mentioned at the top, Tom is the former head of Medicare and Medicaid programs under President George W. Bush. These days, he's a general partner at the private equity firm Welsh Carson Anderson and Stowe in New York City and a principal with the Lincoln Policy Group here in Washington. So Tom, I'm going to start with you. Uh, speaking with your private equity hat on, what do people who try to make money in healthcare think is going to happen in 2018? Nothing. Is that, is that a good answer? I think it's pretty certain nothing. I mean, you can worry about S chip; it's going to get extended. Uh, community health centers will get extended. I think the I just came from a week in San Francisco. For anybody in the investment world, there's 60,000 people that show up every January the first week in San Francisco for the J.P. Morgan conference. And uh, at my age, I'm realizing now I'm really getting old. <laughs> it's a long week. But I would say you know, investors think uh, that really most of what's going on is on the margins. Not much is going to change in election year, and the change is going to be minimal. I mean, you, people worry about CRs. I'm, I've been here for 40 years, so I guess I'm used to the CR. Kick the can down the road for a month, probably a couple more months. Maybe I'll come back in March and check how you're doing. Well, last uh, year they did it in April, as yeah, I recall. No, I think it's going to happen again. But, you know, they don't have to do it until they have to do something, which who knows when that is. So I think uh, from the investment world, um, we're probably the biggest private investors in the U.S. in healthcare. We expect very little change this year. So a lot of change kicking over from last year, but most of it's now pretty locked in, I think. The amount of change this year that they're going to do is probably de minimis. Even with all the, I mean, there was so much that 
was just so odd last year. There's no other good way to put it. I mean, stuff that was impossible to predict. I don't think anybody could have predicted that, you know, chip would be chip would cost zero to renew, and yet it would still be hanging out four months after it expired. Um, with there, there's not a feeling that things are so unpredictable that anything could happen. No, because nothing's changed. I've been doing this too long. In the big picture, not a lot has changed. I mean. Insurance companies are still doing very well. Stocks are trading very high. The hospitals are down, but that's more of a that's much more of a reaction to the fact that most of the investor-owned hospitals are in the South, and the Southern states haven't expanded Medicaid, so their you know their Calvary never arrived. So if you're HCA or tenant, you get a lot of uninsured people in those states, and that hasn't changed. That was a disappointment. Uh, I think after the ACA passed, there were a lot of expectations there would be coverage, much more coverage in the South. And there's been a huge move towards outpatient services and away from inpatient services. And some chains have adapted better than others. HCA is still doing fine. Uh, but I think that's been a bigger change. There have been a lot of, you know, there are a lot of m minor changes in home health and th hospice, things like that, that may drive change. So in specific industries, but generically, I would say healthcare investors are, you know, healthcare's still growing. The ACA has added a lot more people to the system. There's more money coming in. Even the southern states are slowly expanding Medicaid quietly. So, I mean, while people may complain about work requirements, probably a lot more of those 18 remaining southern states, I think it's 18 now, are likely to come in now and take some of the money. So from, from a big picture view, there's probably going to be more coverage slowly, which I'm sure many people would like it to be faster. But I think, I, th I think the change is still slowly, incrementally positive on the coverage side. So, so it seems okay. like good, good news for us after a year of scurrying around. Uh, you know, chasing all the shiny objects. Maybe it will be a quieter year for us reporters. <laughs> well, so no, I'm not saying quiet reporters. I'm saying <laughs> from the investment point of view, it looks relatively stable. Most election years are now. You know, the big changes could happen in the midterm elections. So something that is going to change next year is now with the repeal of the individual mandate, we're going to uh, one presumes see people drop coverage, but also insurers might no longer be quite as eager. We have already seen insurers not eager to be in the individual market. Um, will there be, you know, a a dramatic exit from some of these states, some of these places where it was hard to get insurers to locate? I, you know, I don't think so. I think the big, I don't get myself in trouble here. I seem to always when I'm hanging out with you somehow. Um, <laughs> you know, I think United and that and the, some of the bigger carriers have gotten us in the bigger states. The local blues have actually gotten more into it. The co-ops were, we can discuss that forever, were kind of a structural mistake at the beginning. And that kind of screwed up the, the market. I think it's clearing out a little bit. No, it's not, you know, the tension in some states where some big plans have dropped out has been much more intense than probably deserved. I think most of the blues are settling in and doing okay. In some states, there's, you know, fairly, you know, robust individual market. So I think it's going to settle out. What do you guys think is going to happen with the individual market? <laughs> Marco. I have been struck this year by the resilience of that market. I think there was a lot of kind of scaremongering, especially about the cost sharing reductions going away. You know, a lot of concern that you know this big policy change was going to lead to for to a run for the exits. There obviously were a lot of exits prior to that, so I don't think that people who were saying that were making it up. But I think lots of people were really worried about it. Lots of insurers were saying they were really concerned about it and that they didn't want it to happen. And then it happened, you know, in the middle of the year in this kind of unpredictable way in a way that was sort of maximally disruptive. And essentially, we saw zero exits. So my overall sense is that the insurers that are in this market now mostly want to be in this market and mostly have figured out how to have a relatively stable business. I think it's not impossible to think that there would be some disruption due to the loss of the individual mandate. But my overall sense, if you looked at the filings from this year, is that they think the individual mandate is essentially a pricing issue. They can price it in. They can charge a little bit more to make up for the fact they're going to get slightly less healthy uh, people enrolling in their plans. And I, I don't. I, I'm, I'm, I live to be surprised, and I was surprised a lot of times this year, uh, including by the stability of the market this year. But it has made me more skeptical that this policy change is going to lead to some huge. Uh, churn and disruption, especially because, you know, like none of the insurers yet, you know, they know it's coming. They haven't raised their hands and said, okay, like, you know, I've, I've had enough. This is going to be my last year. They seem to be sort of staying quiet. And that suggests to me that if everything else goes okay this year, they probably could absorb that change. Joanne? I think that there's a lot of other changes coming um, in addition to the, I mean, Margo's right. They, when the CSRs were cut off, there wasn't an exit at that point, and they priced it in, and that's going to be reassuring to those insurers they got through this crisis. But there was a pre-exodus. There were plans who left earlier in the year in anticipation of the CSR cutoff. And CS insurers, by definition, they don't like uncertainty. And we have a president who does uncertain things. <laughs> so 
<laughs> and the whole, you know, and they don't know how many states are going to do association health plans. They're going to be short term. There'll be a lot more short term um, policies. Plans yeah. Out, to my nana. Yeah, yeah. Is this working? Yeah. Oh, to the um, <laughs> the so so I think in, insurers, you know, by definition, don't like uncertainty. We are going through uncertainty not just about how people respond to the mandate, but also how they respond to these other changes. The, I don't think the insurance market next year is going to look like the insurance market this year, and I think there's going to be a lot more state variation. And that there's things about the implementation of these new options that I don't understand yet. I mean, I don't. We haven't seen the final. You know, we haven't seen how states are going to regulate. We haven't seen how the market's going to respond. So it's not going to look like, I mean, we, we are not going to have the same market next year. Insurers might be in it, but they're going to be in a different kind of market. Stephanie? Well, it, I actually think you raise a good point. I don't think we're, despite all the format that happened, I don't think we're seeing really big change, big change for this year. But I kind of think of it as like, a bowling alley and you've got a bowling ball heading toward these pins. And so you, you haven't seen the pins fall yet, but change is coming. And that's really what I think is happening with the same thing you mentioned. We're going to have the short-term health plans that debut. We're going to have association health plans that kick off. We're going to have uh, new Medicaid requirements that fluctuate and change as states get various waivers approved. And all of the things are all of these things are going to coalesce in a way that I increasingly think is going to make where you live have a strong impact on the type of health care access um, that exists, both through state regulation and a lot more um, that you look at the the for example the essential health benefits states will have a lot more latitude in sculpting those for 2019 what that means for investors I don't know but I do think that the individual market if you look at the exchanges will increasingly become a high risk pool and um, I think that's going to have some some profound changes for consumers depending on where they happen to live and what kind of health insurance they get yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to seem like too Pollyannish about it. I think there's a lot of change coming, and there's the, the markets are going to be worse. There are going to be fewer people in them. The products are going to be more expensive. Maybe they're going to have less expansive benefits and and maybe smaller networks. I mean, I think things are going to change, and in some states they're going to get worse. I just don't know if we're going to see the kind of big collapse that everyone has been worried Basi about. Basically, the sort of the the. Despite all the anticipation of what the ACA could do, there have been obstacles ranging from the first Supreme Court ruling in making Medicaid um, optional, Medicaid expansion optional, the way the states didn't implement. I mean, all along, what I, you know, it's a muddle through scenario. We've had since 2014, the ACA has muddled through. Next year, it's going to muddle through with more mud. You know, I you get, you have massive, I mean, the idea, you have massive difference between the states and six territories now. Huge inequities, and I, as you know, I've been screaming about this for 30 years about Medicaid. Whether you want more or less, it's unbelievably unfair, depending on what state you live in. You know, New York covers people with almost 40 percent of poverty. It puts very little money in its own. You know, so I've talked, bitched about. I'm on the board of the Dartmouth Med School in New Hampshire, doesn't put one penny into its Medicaid program. The Romney Universal Coverage Expansion was funded 100 percent by the federal government, without one penny from Massachusetts. Nobody talks about these things. You know, the, the whole issue of the. And I'm a big fan of doing. Uh, the exchange is correctly. It's chicken feed. The money is all in Medicaid. The disruptions are all in Medicaid. The in inequities between the states are all in Medicaid. And the Medicaid system is fundamentally broken. The poor states in the country, like Mississippi, that don't aren't staffed very well, get a bad deal. The smarter ones, I mean, between all of you have covered this to some degree for years, nobody wants to talk about it. Medicaid's a $600 billion a year program. And if nothing changes in current law, it goes to $950 billion a year in 10 years. And even with the evil, terrible Republicans cutting it to the bone, it goes to $750 billion in 10 years. I mean, the program is swallowing the federal government. It's a wonderful program that I'm a big fan of. I chair one of the District of Columbia's three Medicaid plans. I think it's great. But as, if you went to a government class to explain how Medicaid finance works, they'd all pass out and throw up. <laughs> it's insane, and you know that nobody wants to talk about. It. And I, you know, I think the whole thing about I'm not a fan of block grants, but the whole idea of per capita caps, which got dropped last year, was a Bill Clinton, Tom Daschle idea, among other people, to fix the program so that you didn't have these massive inequities among the states. So, it's they're growing so fast, and that the program is structurally insane. It makes no sense. And I had to run. I've been doing it for 40 years. Nobody ever talks about that. The amount of money in the exchanges is chicken feed compared to the amount of money in Medicaid. The number of people affected and covered is chicken feed. But no, everyone's talking about the exchanges and the co-ops and who's covered and who's not. The Medicaid issues swamp them and somehow people get bored and move on to other things. Although I would argue Medicaid ostensibly was the issue that for people who support the ACA, they could say it saved the ACA. It became such a 
this program that many people hadn't significantly thought about suddenly showed itself to be very popular when Republicans tried to change it. And I guess you're right that there are that it has grown, it now covers, what is it, almost one in five Americans, which is really very stunning. And you do see the HHS uh, nominee, um, Alex Azar, who has testified that he supports some of the ideas like the black grants and caps, but I really don't know, no, I, no, frankly, no, if Congress Alex has. Alex is a very good friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, you can play, I'm not a huge Trump fan, it's just so anybody can get confused. I'm not even a small Trump fan. Um, <laughs> Alex is a great guy, and I serve with him, and I've known him for a long time. And he's, it's not a block grant he's in favor of, he's in favor of per capita cap, and they are totally, completely different things. A per capita cap says you can have an entitlement per person, we're going to lock it in where it is, and we're going to fix all the disproportionate share, integral transfer, uh, all, these, all this craziness that's been going on since the late 80s, and Julie's heard me bitch about it since I was at OMB in the White House in the late 80s. It's insane. A lot of Democrats didn't like it either, by the way. Structurally, it's now going to be the biggest program in the government that has no fundamental financing rules. And yeah, but the, but the way they were going to do the per capita cap last year would have been an enormous cut for the states that spend a lot of money. It, most, it, it's all about how you phase things in. I was a fan of it. To, you know, to give away what they have today and phase it back to some sense of equity over the next 20 years. But if you look at Mississippi versus Alabama or you know, New York versus Ohio, the inequities are in, totally indefensible. But do you think Congress will have the appetite to no, look at this? No, they have no guts. They'll never do it. I'm just, I'm, old, I'm getting old and I get the bitch about these things. <laughs> that was my next question, too. Well, I mean, I think one of, one of the sort of failed promises of the Affordable Care Act that we don't talk about enough was the idea that this law was going to sort of create some national equity around health care, that every state was going to have the same standards for Medicaid and the same kind of benefits for Medicaid, that every state was going to have an individual market that was governed by the same set of rules that had the same kind of, you know, sort of transparent, easy to navigate, competitive marketplace where people could buy plans. And I think really, like, we haven't seen that, that some states have, you know, like California is a great example, I think, of a state that really, like, went all in, has, you know, tried as hard as possible to uh, maximize coverage under and take advantage of all of the uh, available resources from the federal government under the law. And they have achieved more of those, you know, high-minded goals of the law, but there are other states that really haven't. And some of that is because of built in sort of like long term inequities in how states fund Medicaid. But other the other reason is that there are a lot of states that could have accepted a lot of money from the federal government to expand their Medicaid programs to cover more people to cover more benefits. Uh, and they chose not to and they also chose not to invest in their exchanges or in outreach. I mean, States are all different and they have been for a long time, but the Affordable Care Act was supposed to kind of create a national system, create more standardization across the states. Really don't think that we've seen that to the degree that its drafters had expected. Go ahead. No, I think that that's um, one of the, I mean, you know, we could live in a parallel, parallel universe where um, healthcare was about healthcare and not a proxy for politics. We don't live in that universe. So could you have fixed, um, what needed to be fixed? Yeah, I mean, you could fix, I mean, we, we're not very good at fixing things. The ACA, some of it really could have been fixed if you sat down and tried to fix it, but instead everybody just shot at each other. There were some design flaws and some misses, you know, some wrong assumptions, some mistakes in the way it was drafted. There were some mistakes in things the insurers did in the first few years, but it became, it didn't become the national, I mean, it's a huge program, Medicaid and the, and the exchanges and the delivery system and everything else. I mean, if we lived in a different era, they could have sat down and said, you know, this didn't work so well, let's try this. But we all saw what happened instead, so. That's what we did after the, the 1997 Balanced Budget Act. There were how many, three, you know, basically um, uh, fix, huge fix bills to the, to the Balanced or, Budget or, Act. Or, or Medicare D, which was very, it was quite not as, the drug benefit, it wasn't as politicized as, I mean, Tom worked we on that. Ten, we had 10 Democrats in the Right, it was not it was as- Much less partisan. Polit but those, par those Democrats who really didn't like it or who wanted to have a, a larger government role, you know, sort of the equivalent of a public plan, they didn't, they, they, they fought like on the press conference level. They didn't fight on like my reason for living level. And they, you know, the different, they went out and got people in their districts to sign up and they would, you know, every year they have a press conference and introduce some alternatives. But, but fairness, basically- Yeah, but fairness that, and I'm like, Critical. I'm a relatively supportive of the ACA. I thought it was too much and too big. I think they were a little too far, and I think they made a mistake passing it by party line vote. But you know, but you couldn't have passed it without a party well, line vote. I know, vote. and I you can go back and read all the Senator Grassley stuff and all that stuff. But you know, Senator Frist and I, and at the time, spent a lot of time with Senator Kennedy, who I liked a lot. 
He voted for the drug bill. People forget that. Uh, we spent a lot of time just trying to get a handful of Democrats to go for that. And you know what? I, Nancy Ann's a friend of mine. I love her. She's great. I respect what they did. I, don't, I would have done probably 75% of the spending they did. Uh, but the, you know, once they made the decision to make a 100% party line vote, you're going to deal with a 10-year knife fight. It's just the way it is, and it's unfortunate. But everybody's either for it or against it, and it's sad. And I think that it's been miserable for politics. And there are a lot of things that could have been fixed, and they could have found a middle ground. And you can blame. In 2010, there are probably a handful of Republicans that should have found a way to cut a deal and didn't. But unfortunately, anytime you do something that big by a party line vote, which the Republicans are finding out too with the tax bill, it gets ugly for a long time, and that's not good for anybody. Well, I want to hit one more topic before we open it to questions, so be thinking about your questions. There's mics right there on each side. Um, drug prices, that's something else that's ostensibly bipartisan. Everybody thinks drug prices are too high. We didn't see really anything last year. Are we going to see anything this year? Maybe at the margins. I don't think you see a, um, I mean, I think that there's the, the. I mean, does anyone in the world really understand drug prices? No. So <laughs> could they do some things around the margins and PBMs and rebates and transparency? Maybe. And you'll also see that in some of the states. It is already beginning in some of the states. Pharma has not blocked everything in the states, which is interesting. But they also, again, what's happened in the states is still fairly at the margins. Do I think we're going to see a major bipartisan push to um, change drug prices in this country next year? No. Can you see a little tinkering here and there? I don't even think you're going to see that much tinkering federally. Maybe some little, a little bipartisan tinkering around the edges. Tom, do you see anything happening on, you know, see, on this big issue that everybody agrees on? I don't see Congress doing anything. Alex, obviously, is getting beaten up for coming from the drug industry, but the fact is he knows pretty well. And uh, he says he's determined to do some things. How much leeway he gets in the administration, who knows? But I mean, look, you can't do it with that statute. I would take all the Part B drugs and put them in Part D. That would save you a hell of money right off the bat. Part D is a joke. Part B is a joke. At least you put them in the, in the, in the Part D. That would save you money and probably that I don't think they can do a statutory change. You know, one thing I said for, again, 25 years they had to do is, you know, something comes out of FDA, and Scott Gottlieb is also a very smart, good guy. Uh, CMS reads about the New York Times and then decides what to pay him. You know, it's already approved. The ship sailed. I mean, there's no reason in the world that CMS and FDA can't coordinate. And if you really want to change it, you could tell drug companies when they came in, if you'd like to give us an idea of your pricing for the next five years, then we'll put you on the fast track. And if you want to be on the slow track, we'll put your application on a little boat to Hong Kong for a while. When it gets back, we'll look at it. Um, because you know, appro approval of drugs and devices and prices are completely, HHS, they can talk to each other and they don't. And some people think there's statute, I don't think there are statute limitations. And the fact is that's something they could do tomorrow and they should have done a long time ago. And I advocated in the last Bush administration got hammered, didn't they? <laughs> but you know, there are a lot of ways that you can, look, drug companies are interested in getting quick approvals and uh, you can't control their prices for five years, but you can certainly get ideas as they're going through the process what their pricing is gonna be. And they don't do that at all. I actually do agree that um, Alex Azar will probably try to tackle some elements of drug pricing. Um, I think that is high on his priority list. I do think in the, that um, you're right. I think a lot of the congressional stuff will be more on the margins. And I think the other thing that we'll, we'll see as there are increasing debates about the cost of drug prices is uh, more of a drumbeat from Democrats for Medicaid buy-in and, and um, uh, single payer, especially around the midterm elections. I think we'll be hearing a lot more about that. and. Um, it'll be interesting to see where that goes. In defense of congressional inaction on this issue, <laughs> I actually think this is a very difficult problem to solve. I don't think that there are a bunch of obvious, easy, costless changes that will have a big effect on drug prices and that won't have other ancillary effects that we would not like. So, it, you know, I think in some of these areas, there are ideas on, on the shelf, and it's just a question of politically whether they can be achieved or whether consensus can be built around them. I think on drug prices, the on the margin stuff is on the shelf. The kind of big stuff, I think, needs more cooking. OK. We're going to open it to your questions. Um, there are two mics, as I said, one on either side. Uh, two requests. Please tell us who you are before you ask a question. And please ask a question. Don't give a speech. We only have a few minutes. <laughs> nah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Mike Miller. I'm a health policy consultant physician. I'm senior policy advisor for Healthy Women, and Tom has deemed me a longtime troublemaker. So He's deemed a lot of people longtime troublemakers. All of us. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm in a very good company. Uh, that's sort of the basis for my question a little bit. Um, there's been a recent thing from the administration about enabling providers to not do things based upon their religious or moral beliefs, and then this morning they announced that um, 
There's a new conscien conscience and religious freedom division being formed in the Office of Civil Rights at HHS. Can you guys comment? Is this uh, waving of hands, or is this substantive and something people? I was actually going to hold it off to talk about next week, but I guess we can um, talk about it briefly now. I, let sorry, me just sorry, jump sorry, in because this is an issue that I covered, and I was on happened to be on the press call about it. Um, you're right; it was announced uh, this morning um, uh, by uh, Acting Secretary Hargan, and what. <sighs> It's a race to be seen kind of what this does. They are soliciting a new website. They're asking for people to file complaints. There is a regulation at the White House at this point that um, that we're expecting would uh, shield health care practitioners from um, things such as treating someone who's transgender if they have um, moral or conscious objections. But my sense from the from the press call and from the press event this morning is that, this is really something that the um, administration thinks is a big deal. They want to roll this out to other agencies. They see this as sort of um, uh, beyond just kind of abortion issues as something that there really is a large number of people who are being discriminated against based on their religion and um, moral beliefs. And they want to, um, they're soliciting um, cases to try and investigate. And I think it will be really important and fascinating to watch where this office goes. And one thing I would, um, I don't know what the answer is, but I would watch what happens in the pharmacy realm as well. We've gone back and forth over the years with you know, whether pharmacists are required to give certain referrals or sell like the morning after pill, whatever. That that um, may also bubble up through this. I haven't heard it yet. Maybe I missed it. I have not yet heard that in the last, since we started reporting on this two days ago, but I think it could easily. And, if and you're the only one, pharmacy in town, it's an issue. Right? One other quick note you will see from the, the press conference this morning that they're really trying to look at Congress, also Republicans trying to pass some legislation that would um, give more teeth to some of these statutes. So that will be significant to watch, too. Although they've been trying that since 2000. So they took back control in 2011. Has, they can't get it through the Senate. So Question. just what, oh, one, okay. one small note about this, which is that there's actually a civil rights provision in the Affordable Care Act that is sort of not totally implemented, but I think is going to bump up against this a little bit without legislation that says that hospitals and insurers can't discriminate against people on the basis of including other things, sex, which the Obama administration interpreted to include transgender people. So, you know, it may be the case that institutions, the hospital has to treat people for, and the insurance company has to cover uh, services for transgender people, but then you would have individual practitioners who under this new conscience provision would be able to opt out of participating in that coverage. Okay. Question over here. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, Alex Schechter with Medicaid Health Plans of America. This is probably for Tom and for uh, Stephanie. Um, Affordable Care Act preceded um, different horizontal uh, integration and ver uh, mergers, you know, WellCare, or, or rather WellPoint acquiring uh, Amer Group, and then you had a realignment and mergers that were uh, announced later on that failed uh, FCC uh, scrutiny. You're now seeing in the absence of repeal and replace uh, some vertical integration, CBS Aetna, uh, Humana with Kindred, United with DeVita. What trends do you see in the absence of a major federal policy uh, pivot, if you will? Well, we were the ones that bought Kindred with Humana, so I could probably <laughs> comment if you want. I think it's a hell of an idea. <laughs> uh, that's a little. That's a much more narrow thing. I think it's a, the, the post-acute space is much narrow. I think the bigger issue really is whether you can do the Aetna, uh, the Aetna CVS merger and whether they're actually going to be able to run vertically integrated. I mean, I don't think there's going to be a big antitrust issue. I used to be a bad antitrust lawyer years ago. I think I think the other ones, you know, the the, uh, the other giant mergers that failed last year were different. The issue is really is going to work. Can you really have CVS initiating? You know, care, primary care through many clinics and feeding back into networks. So is that really going to work? You know, they're certainly going to try it. Um, a lot of other mergers like that. People remember when Humana was actually a hospital chain and an HMO. That didn't work 20 years ago. I mean, originally, Humana was a giant hospital chain, not an HMO. So I think when you get in these vertical, you know, massive integrated chains, you tend to irritate a lot of the customers. So I, it'll, we'll see. I think I think there's going to be a challenge in making the CVS that thing work. But you know. Uh, I would not be surprised to see Walgreens do something similar shortly and see more integration that way. I think the antitrust problems with the, you know, there's only so many large commercial plans left and they seem to be somewhat prohibitive of integrating at this point. So I think you're going to see more of that. I think it's going to be a challenge to see if they can make it happen or not. The, the Humana thing, I was joking with Kendra, we were the one of the financiers there and it's a uh, much smaller impact. 
Yeah, I, th I definitely think we're going to see more of that integration. I, I totally agree. We have to see what happens and does it work with CVS. I mean, a lot of people may not want to go in and get their care. Some of their CF CVSs may not be that um, well organized and run. I know my CVS is not. Um, but I also, totally fascinating, I really want to see what's going to happen with the executive order that called for this in investigation and analysis and report on hospital mergers. Um, I'm very puzzled as to what that's going to yield um, and kind of how the Trump administration may use that. Um, yeah, I was, you don't I was hear gonna, much about it. Yeah, I was going to point that out too. So that was part of the same executive order that set up the association health plans and the short-term health plans, and those got a lot more ink. But at the bottom, there was this long section where it seems like the Trump administration really is concerned about consolidation in the healthcare industry and wants to think about new strategies for trying to preserve uh, competition. I think it was sort of lumped in there because there was this concern about insurance competition and in the exchanges, but I think it potentially could be much broader. I don't know uh, what the next shoe to drop is on that, but I'm very curious who put that in there and uh, what the result be the will report. be. They'll come yeah. Out. yeah. Well, they, should be, they should be worried about consolidation in the hospital industry because the reality is the antitrust law, I spent a lot of time when I was at CMS working with the FTC trying to do something about it, and the antitrust law on the hospital side is long, entrenched, and tough, and you get, look, I live in Northern Virginia, anybody going any place other than Inova in Northern Virginia the last 30 years, they own everything. Nice people, <laughs> it's a pretty big monopoly. Uh, and most most towns in the, in the U.S., big cities, have basically integrated into two or three giant systems, So, they, but the hospital antitrust law is pretty tough to change. The doctor antitrust law is a lot easier. You can docs have a lot tougher time colluding. Um, so, but I think you know. I think the odds of them turning that around, given the case law, the last thirty years is pretty close to zero. Okay. Well, I think there's a concern about um, consolidation across markets. So FTC is like really good at dealing with if you're a hospital in one town, you buy the hospital next door. If if that's any competitive, they can get involved. But if you buy a bunch of hospitals sort of sprinkled throughout your state, that's technically they don't really enforce that now. But there is growing evidence that that leads to increased prices because the insurers tend to operate across those markets. And so you have this increased negotiating leverage by having more entities. Mm -hmm. Sounds like UPMC in Allegheny. That's fun. <laughs> We're not going there. <laughs> Over here. Hi there, my name is Mike Collins. I'm a healthcare policy analyst for a contractor that verifies eligibility for people applying through the federal marketplace. Um, and my job is to follow health policy news every day. So Julie, thank you, and KHN and Politico for Political Pulse. I read them every morning and it tells me what else I need to read, particularly, yeah, and it's usually the other panelists. So it works out great. Um, you touched on this earlier, <coughs> excuse me. Um, on the uh, effect of the mandate. Uh, now, CBO said that uh, the, if that'll drop uh, enrollment in all plans about four million dollars ne next four million people next year, thirteen million by 2027. Um, but they also said, "Oh, don't rely on our numbers. We think we're wrong. We're re evaluating our uh, methodology. But if you want to rely on it for 300 billion or so in offsetting the tax cuts, go ahead and do it." So our insurance companies building in, and I'm talking about a number, uh, you know, a real number percentage of what they think the actual drop in, in enrollment will be when the mandate goes away. Personally, I don't think it'll be anywhere near that much, but I'm wondering what carriers think. Really good question. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could see some hints that they were doing that this year. So if you right. looked, and, and Kaiser Family Foundation actually did a great report and did a lot of the aggregating work, so this is why I know this, mm -hmm. is, you they know. They relied on, on KHN. Um, early okay. in, the, in the season, they looked at the pr preliminary rate filings from uh, insurers across the country. And what they found is they said, okay, like here's our normal rate, what we think from medical trend, from tax changes, from, you know, whatever. Uh, from how we did last year. And then here's how much more it will cost if the CSRs go away. And here's how much more it will cost if the individual mandate goes away. So they actually, a lot of insurers actually told their insurance regulators, this is the price that we think for this policy change. And so that suggests to me that their actuaries are already thinking about how much smaller is the market going to get as a result of this, how much sicker is it going to be, and how much is it going to cost me. And in general, it looked like insurers actually were pricing a smaller increase for the individual mandate going away than they were for the CSR risk. And that also suggests that maybe CBO has overestimated the degree of the effect because they were largely kind of in the single digit increases, although there was a lot of variation depending on the market and the particular insurer. And you know, we'll, we'll begin seeing them in the spring. Um, it's a few more months. Um, we'll also get a CBO guesstimate. We'll get, yeah, we'll have more CBO data. We'll have a little bit more 
understanding of what's going on with AHPs and short-term plans. But I mean, if you're an insurer and you have to go through, you know, th there are various rates of rate of review in the states. Some are more aggressive than others. Some aren't aggressive at all. But you know, it's way easier if you're an insurer to come up with your preliminary number that's high and you know, the reg it'll be way easier in September to say, oh, you know, we can drop it a few points than, than it is to do the other way around. So the, the numbers that we see in May m may, be, I mean, this is completely a guess. We, they may be higher. Cons insurers are conservative, right? You're gonna, you may see a higher preliminary projected rate in May than we actually see when they're finalized in September. But also, you would imagine that CBO is talking to actuaries mm -hmm. from actual insurance companies in making its estimates. So, you know, the fact that CBO is ready to revisit in some ways, I think, reflects the fact that experts are already thinking about this question and trying to come up with the right answer. And we don't know what's going to happen, you know, right now. No one's even talking about the stabilization bill. Um, no one thinks it's going to fix everything. but. You know, it would it all these zero premium things. You know, if they start the CSRs again, I mean, who knows how they price all that in? Um, right now, it's not even part of the conversation. I think Collins does want to come back to it somehow. Um, you know, when we're on, C, you know, CR number forty-three, I don't know when they'll get to it, but <laughs> uh, and I said it's like going to be like, you know, there'll be one a day. It's like you know, taking your vitamins. Um, <laughs> So, so I think that's another thing that is off the table right now, but it's in the wings and that it wouldn't be a complete mitigation, but it might be a partial mitigation. Definitely full employment for actuaries for the next few months. <laughs> um, I hate to say it, but that is absolutely all the time we have for today. I want to thank our studio audience very much for coming. Hope you had a good time. And if not, we still have some snacks outside, I think. Uh, for you out there in podcast land, thank you for listening. Thanks to our guest, Tom Scully. If you enjoyed the podcast, you can subscribe wherever you get your podcast. We'd also appreciate it if you left a review. That will help other people find us, too. If we didn't get to your question, you can also always, excuse me, email us at whatthehealth at kff.org, or you can tweet me. I'm at Jay Rovner. <laughs> you turned your microphone off. I did, I did. <laughs> I'm at Sanger Katz. And I'm at Joanne Kennan. At Steph Armour 1. And we'll I'm, be back I'm in your feed. Oh. one of those. <laughs> <laughs> We'll be back in your feed next week. In the meantime, be healthy. <laughs>